Welcome to today's episode and thank you so much for turning in again. Today we got a topic that is relevant for all of us because unfortunately way too many people get diagnosed with cancer. And that's a life altering event and, and something where you're often being stuck like, what, what do I do now? What happens? So I'm, I'm really, really excited that I got an expert in on, uh, on this subject. I talked to a medical doctor, Eva Marie Hasenbeck, uh, on one of the earlier episodes. And she's like one of the highest certified functional medicine doctors in Europe. And she was like, there's one person you have to talk to. She is extremely bright. She knows her stuff and she's an amazing human being. So, uh, so this is the person that I can, uh, I can recommend. So the person I was lucky to get on the podcast today is a naturopathic doctor, Laurie Bouchard. She also has a health degree from Western University, and then she did her doctorate in naturopathic medicine, which is a four-year program. We're going to talk a bit more about that, about how you actually learn how to heal the body with, uh, with different modalities. And she's a best-selling author as well. She wrote the book, Live Longer and Stronger with Breast Cancer, something that way too many people get hit by. It's been endorsed by a lot of Famous people that know their stuff as well. I won't try and pronounce their names today, but uh, you can look that up afterwards. So Laurie, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Hi, Mas. That was a great introduction. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be a great conversation here. This is going to be fun. So Laurie, I said a little bit about who you are, but like, how do you get into health and, and where you are today? Yeah. So I was basically raised by natural medicine. I... I remember when I was really young, I um, would always ask my mom to go to the doctor and to get medication. Like, how strange is that? I would think like, oh, my friends are going on antibiotics. Like, how come when I'm sick, I can't go to the doctors and get this done? And my mom would always say, you know, your body has this amazing ability to heal. Let's rest. Let's, she would always like shove all these supplements down my throat full of vitamins. And she's like, your body, what it, it has that natural intelligence within it. And so I've always, um, I didn't really love that approach when I was younger. I just felt like I just want a pill to make me feel better. Like, why can't, why can't I get that? And so, and I think that's kind of like how a lot of us are raised. Like you have a symptom, you take a pill and you just feel better. And even like, what does health really mean? Like, does that mean that you're not on drugs or does that mean you have tons of energy? So there's a lot of, um, I was raised into this field where my mom like really did just talk about health my entire life. Um, so it was just like a natural progression for me to get into the health field and really to learn everything possible about the human body and what really makes it run effectively. So, so that was my story of getting into it. And then even for cancer, like, why did I decide to go with cancer? It's one of the most complicated diseases. Um, we're still searching for this cure after years and years of trillions of dollars going into this condition. And really, it's like, why would someone want to go into this when you feel like it's kind of like a frustrating, um, never ending topic? Um, but for me, like when I graduated from med school, when I saw my first cancer patient, he was given a month to live. He was basically um, told to get his affairs in order. He said, you know, they've tried chemo. They've done every single radiation possible. They've done everything to help um, to help fight this disease. And he came to my door saying, hey, I need something else. Like, I'm not ready to die. I, I'll do whatever you say. And so this patient, um, he actually ended up living eight years longer after this palliative of terminal diagnosis. And I felt like, wow, there's a lot of missed education in this. Like he, he thought he did everything for cancer, mm. but really a lot of the basic stuff, it's like he thought he was healthy his whole life and cancer just kind of like struck at him. So when you kind of like dig deeper into like, what is actually, what is health and what is cancer and what are all these things? Like, how do we approach it differently? That's where uh, my passion is to really help people who are um, confused or not confident or just really told they have a month to live and ran out of options so that's where that's where the excitement comes for me and where i'm really passionate about helping people with that diagnosis that's fantastic it must be incredible as well to see those patients coming in and helping them actually extend their life and like seeing that there are opportunities as well it's amazing like even just um it was a few days ago where a patient she's 86 years old she's she's done chemo and she's like you know what i really just don't want to um keep putting that chemo in i don't want to put that toxicity into my system anymore. I don't want to do any more drugs. I just want to, um, I just want to give my body what it needs. And this was a year ago. She now recently was like, I have, my cancer hasn't grown. It's actually shrinking. And at the age of 86, you wouldn't think that you would think that, oh, you're 86. Like your body's 
shutting down and just kind of expect anything to go downhill from there. But for her, she's like, hallelujah, things are amazing and God bless. So it's really great. Yeah. It's, it's amazing to see these miracles, right? Yeah. Yeah. I often hear about miracles in functional medicine, but you see it's occurring again and again, but it's the individualized approach. Exactly. Exactly. And it's interesting because it's not just like one thing, right? It's not like I found this miracle drug in the jungle of <laughs> wherever. It's like they found this one herb that cured cancer. No, it's it's that whole picture of what you do. Yeah. It's the holistic picture. So just yeah. quickly jumping in, naturopathic doctor. Um, what does that mean? And like, what, what does that come from? Okay, so in Canada, I'm from Ontario, and so it's a we're primary care physicians that can treat and diagnose um, any condition, basically, and, and give um, certain medications. So in every province in Ontario, our uh, licensing body is different. So what we're allowed to prescribe here is a little bit different than BC or from Calgary. Um, and so we have four years of undergraduate, so we learn all the basic sciences of physiology, anatomy, chemistry, biology, all the ologies when it comes to the body. And then in um, naturopathic school, so it's a four-year postgraduate degree, and we have to take two different licensing exams and continually to improve as far as what we're learning and educated on. Um, the base, the difference between a medical doctor and a naturopathic doctor is that we all have like the same sciences behind our name, but it's the last two years of med school that is that is very different. So instead of it being um, primary pharmacology and drugs and just like one condition, one treatment and following kind of that algorithm of everyone with that condition gets the same drug. In, natu in naturopathic medicine, we take that personalized approach. So we learn about homeopathy and botanical medicine, acupuncture, how our mindset and psychology has a lot to do with our disease process too. So the main difference too is we spend a good hour with every single patient when we see them because we need that full history of understanding them at their core, not just the label that was slapped onto them after years of feeling a certain way. So it's a more integrative um, whole body approach, treating the root cause of the condition versus treating the symptom. Got it. And you learn a lot about nutrition as well. <clears throat> so where the traditional medical doctors, at least in Denmark, they have one day, I was shocked when I heard that, one day where they've been taught about nutri like food, then that's a big part of your education, if I understand it correct. Yeah, clinical nutrition is, I'd say, at the core of what we learn in school, because really, you can't um, expect to be healthy if you're just putting garbage in your body all the time. And we in Canada, too, the regulations of like what's in our food, it's not, um, it's just a very poor regulation system. So what's safe in Canada would not be safe in other parts of the world. So a lot of pesticides, toxicity, a lot of herbicides, GMO, glyphosates, all those things that we're, we're just putting into our system that you don't really know about unless you actually listen to podcasts like yours, I'm sure, right? Where it's like, okay, this is actually what's going into our food. And you've probably heard like you are what you eat, right? Mm. So what you put in your body is that fuel. But then I also, it's one step further, you are what you absorb, right? So if you can't even absorb it, then it's like, you could be having the best diet, but if you're not absorbing any of it then it doesn't matter so yeah yeah a big part a big part of the school for sure fantastic so in denmark we're quite lucky we have some of the strictest restrictions in the world in regards to pets to science and so on but we still have way too much um but there's been a few tests like where you test the urine afterwards where you have a family going from conven conventional uh, non-organic uh, fruit and so on and then changing it you see the the, the changes in there in the urine of how many pesticides, pesticides they have, right? It's it's crazy, like what we are putting in our mouth and in our bodies. And yeah, even like further with that, it's interesting because they were doing studies on newborn babies and they saw over 200 chemicals in the placenta. So at birth, you're just born with all of the, an overburden of chemicals. So even if you think like, oh, my whole life I'm eating organic, I'm doing all these things. It's like, well, what did your mother do? What did her mother do? Mm. And what was she exposed to? What were all those um, toxins that she's been exposed to that now you've just kind of like inherited by default? So you can thank your mother for a lot of those things that she didn't even know about, right? Yes. They're generating back. Luckily, we're learning a lot more now. So let's hope that we're doing better. So if, if we're digging in or going into cancer, so just like, 
we hear so much about it, but what is cancer actually? For someone that hasn't been studying it or someone that's just like got this label put on them, like what does it actually mean? Yeah. So a lot of us just think of cancer as a tumor. It's just something that, oh, I just got this tumor. Let's just cut it out and get rid of it. We need to get rid of that mindset. Uh, Cancer is actually a process. It's something that can take up to seven to 10 years to develop and even to be found on any kind of imaging. So it's something where our cells are really striving to use oxygen properly. So if we think of cancer, it's really interesting. Um, A lot of people think it's like, oh, I I just got it. I, I thought I was healthy my whole life and it's something that just came. But really it can be years and years of that buildup. So it's interesting even to look at like the history of what cancer is. So if you think of like in the 1600s, the the ancient Greeks thought it was like the angering of the gods. So if you did something wrong and you were being punished in a certain way, and then you kind of fast forward in time, they thought it was something contagious, that it's something that you just like contracted from someone else. So you would be put into quarantine. You'd actually have to leave your city because they thought, oh, you might pass that to someone else. Um, And then it's only in the 1970s where they thought up until then it was purely genetic. So it's almost like you're born with this bad luck. It's like, oh, your mom had it. So now you have it. And it's this purely genetic disease. So that's called the somatic theory of cancer. Since the 1970s, that's actually changed quite a bit where we know our environment plays this huge role in how the onset of cancer happens. And we know that because there's been cell studies where they look at the actual like DNA of cancer cells, so the nucleus, if the actual, if there's cancer in the nucleus and it's placed into a healthy cell, like where the cytoplasm, the extracellular matrix, all of that is healthy. If that cancer's DNA goes into that cell, the cancer actually disappears. And the opposite is true. So in a non-DNA, a non, uh, the nuclei that isn't cancerous is placed into a, um, yeah, if, if a cancer is what I'm getting, I'm trying to, <laughs> if the cancer is part of the nucleus is actually placed into a healthy one, then the cancer disappears versus if a healthy DNA, so the nucleus that does not have cancer, is placed into a really toxic cellular environment, it turns those genes on and cancer, cancer turns on. So when you think of like what cancer actually is, it's really the dividing of cells and continuously where the cells are just not dying off. So that's where it's like that proliferation and it eventually turns into a tumor. So it's really the uncontrolled um, cancerous growth is what cancer is. Super interesting. And it's fascinating the whole paradigm shift that we had, right? As you just told the history about like what you thought cancer was and also yeah. how we had a period in time where everything was genetic, right? Now we're doing the DNA test and then we know exactly what's going to happen to us. But we also have the epigenetics where you're talking about like, what environment do you actually put the cells and you might be predisposed to have a higher likelihood of getting it but what's like what environment is actually in so is it gonna is it gonna happen or not exactly and if you do have to say like the BRCA gene you are five times more likely to get it so if you have that genetic predisposition but just because you have that gene doesn't mean you need to like slice off your breasts take out your ovaries take everything out there's a huge chance that if you do all the right things that you will not ever get it in your lifetime. So we have so much power and even our inherited weaknesses that we're not like doomed to have it. And that's, I think a lot of people that come in, they still have that mentality of, and maybe their doctors tell them that like, oh, I, there's, I have no control over this. This is bad luck. I was dealt shitty cards, right? I was just doomed to have this. But no, we know that's no longer true. You can do so much to kind of change that epigenetic picture and control how those cells are continually dividing. So it's pretty exciting when you learn more about the epigenetics and the microenvironment of the tumor that we have a lot more power than we thought, right? Like how discouraging would that be to think the gods are angry at you or like you have to be quarantined because actually that sounds familiar, That sounds like something is happening right now. (laughs) Yeah. And I guess like when it, there are certain conditions that um, I guess would be contagious when it comes Mm. to cancer. So we know that for example, like H pylori, so that bacteria is contagious. And if it's not treated, it can lead to gastric cancers down the road or same with like Epstein-Barr virus. We know that virus is contagious and you can actually develop lymphoma if years and years treat not treated properly or same with like HPV. We know that virus has been linked to cervical cancers. And so 
getting those early detection and treating it is really saving you from years down the road, kind of like peeking its ugly head into a cancer. And that's a big part of the treatment too, right? If someone has any of those conditions that we know are caused from a virus or a bacteria, um, that has to be the root of how we treat, not just a drug, right? Mm. I agree. So we talked a little bit about what you think is the cause of cancer. Like one thing is that we are predisposed from our genetics. Another thing is oxygen. I just took a course, an online course from Harvard on cell biology, which was super fascinating to actually hear very much like how oxygen is so important for the cells uh, and the mitochondria. So what else can we kind of understand for understanding like the, the cause of cancer in your opinion? Yeah. So if you think of like, think of a 10,000 billion piece puzzle, jigsaw puzzle, that's kind of like all of the different pieces of what can cause cancer. So it's not just the somatic theory of genetics. It's not just because you were a smoker, because you even see a lot of smokers who smoke their whole life and they don't develop lung cancer. So it's Mm. not like that one thing will cause that one disease. And same with like getting a bacteria, right? Like not everyone with that bacteria will express that condition. It's really that environment that that it's growing in or able to grow in. So all of those pieces, so think of like the thousands of things that can actually turn the genetics on and change the cytoplasm and make that environment different. Um, so just to kind of like list off some of them, um, sugar, blood sugar, like how we deal with sugar in our body. Um, we know that cancer cells have 20 times more insulin receptors on them. So they just like love all that sugar and they use them as fuel to grow. Um, the other thing is glyphosates. So we, th- I've seen where a few patients, they're early, um, they're early, they're up early in the morning golfing. So like, they're the first ones on the, the freshly sprayed grass. Um, and now they have lymphoma. So we just know that there's certain connections and same with like asbestos and lung cancers. Um, we know that molds can actually affect our immune system and how, how our body is fighting abnormal cells and especially cancer. Right. Um, so stress, stress is a big one. I've seen where people like have the perfect diet, they eat all organic, they do all the right things, but they're just like, their cortisol is through the roof. And so if you're one of those people, they're like, go, 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 go all the time then that your immune system just doesn't even have a chance. Like you're suppressing your immune all the time. Um, and even I feel like past traumas. So if there's things that you're just repressing for all of these years and you're just not able to let go of, there's that subconscious stressor where that plays a huge toll and where cancer comes out. I would say like 80% of the people that come into my practice, they almost know that there was something that just like offset it. Like they, they, they wouldn't say they've been perfectly healthy their entire life, but they just felt like, you know, I was diagnosed right after this really, really intense divorce or mm. a grief or something that came up that just like, it changed the whole dynamics of the system. So that's a big deal too, that's overlooked. So until those traumas and those emotional um, suppressions are released, like your body's still really in that like fight or flight or freeze mode, right? So um, yeah, so hormones, blood sugar, traumas, pesticides, like the list really goes on. Infections that we haven't dealt with, like the virus and bacteria that we've talked about. Um, and then even going further from that, it's like, how is our body running in general? Like, are we pooping every day? Are we getting rid of toxicity that we shouldn't be um, holding on to? Like, I've seen where people don't go more than once a week. Wow. And they're like, oh, my doctor said that's always normal. Like if that's been my history and that's my pattern, then that's exactly like, that's totally fine. And I'm like, well, what are you <laughs> like, what, how, like you must feel awful. And they, they do feel awful. So it's more stress on the liver. These, um, you get like auto intoxication where things just cause more inflammation in the body. So it's really like going back to the basics of like, how is our, how, what makes up a healthy cell and let's do everything. So it doesn't go into that, um, into that cancering process Hmm. so someone who just got diagnosed with cancer would they have to choose between the conventional route radiation chemo surgery or go with the naturopathic approach or can they do both yeah so definitely definitely both i want to just like get that myth right out there because a lot of people do get really scared like as soon as they get diagnosed they see their oncologist and they're told don't do anything else 
And I just think that's absolutely crazy. Like to not look at the food that we're eating, how we deal with stress, everything that we listed and like, just take this one magical drug. We know that is not working any longer. Like we've been trying to find this cure for years and years and years in the war against cancer. And we have all of these missions and all the money that's going into that. We know that you need to take an integrative approach. You need mm. to look at that whole picture. I have some patients who choose not to do chemo, radiation and surgery. They just know that if you remove that primary tumor site, then that kind of like opens up the floodgates for all those abnormal cells to search for other cancer cells in the body. And it can actually progress a cancer condition. So some patients say, no, I want to do everything naturally first. Um, I, I always say, let's take that integrative approach more to cover my butt. Yeah. <laughs> There's my licensing body. I say, no, let's look at all options and see what, but everyone's so different. Like one cancer is very different than a different type of cancer to say for everyone that they need chemo. Maybe it's a very slow growing and not, it's not proliferating as fast as someone else who'd say, okay, you would actually be a better candidate for chemo and radiation. So I think that's the bigger picture is looking at your specific case looking at what type of cancer, how fast it's proliferating. These are all things that you could find out in Canada. We do oncotype testing to see the aggressiveness of it. Um, so yeah, the pa there's a few patients actually where they're like, no, I don't want to do all of those toxic things. And now it's really cool when they do ultrasounds, they see like this collagen barrier around the tumor site and it's like a necrotic dead tissue. So this mm. is from like no surgery, no chemo, no radiation and doing everything possible in more of a natural way and their oncologist is like oh I guess there's no point taking anything out because it's just like a dead lump there's no blood flow going to that area so I've seen all of it and it's really a personal choice from the patient too where they feel comfortable um what they feel comfortable with and but it's always has to be after the research is done like don't just follow what your one doctor says like get mm -hmm. many opinions go see many health professionals even one oncologist's opinion of what you should do would be very different from another one. So you want to get at least three or four different opinions before you just like jump into therapy or jump into a surgery. I've even seen that with people's thyroid. They thought it was cancerous. They take it out and they're like, oh, there was no cancer there. It was totally benign. And now they have no thyroid and are stuck on meds the rest of their life and have mm. issues with balancing calcium and all of the other things that come along with it. And so it's really sad how many people just see their oncologist or their medical team as like a god and do everything that they say, but really it's like, no, that those times have changed where you're, the patient is in the power, right? Like you can make those decisions and you can see what is best for your specific case. Yeah, no, I know that, uh, that pisses a lot of doctors off. Uh, they call it like doctor shopping. But when you look at, I'm reading this book that they have in the medical school in, the, in Denmark, where it says about how often doctors disagree is crazy. When I was reading that, I was like, holy shit. Like some yeah. of the numbers and different diseases, like if you put the same results to two different doctors, they would give two very different uh, results. And it's so true. It's crazy. I when I was um, I was visiting a patient who um, was in the ICU. He was in a terrible state. But I was talking with a few of the oncologists there, like the ICU emergency doctors, and one only one out of the eight that I met believe that nutrition was important. And even like high dose vitamin C, he's like, you know, two thirds of the world uses it. You think of India and like all of the different countries that have used natural medicines to cure. He's like, this is crazy. He's like the wing of this hospital should have a whole nutrition feel wing mm. to it because they're putting like corn syrup in this patient's feeding tube. Like he's like, this is just wrong. You, you can't bring someone back to life on fructose and corn syrup. So, but you're right. Like every single oncologist had a different opinion, a different view. Um, but I was really sad to see only one person really thought one doctor with all of their diplomas and degrees behind them thought that what they're putting in their body besides all these meds was important. So yeah, getting, getting the right doctor and you, you can choose, like you can be picky and say like, you know what, this pay, this doctor isn't looking at me as a person. They're just looking at my disease and my diagnosis without even looking at me in the eyes, right? Like you want someone who's seeing you as a whole, not just, oh, you've got this label. Let's just treat that. So that, that's super difficult. Many places. Like in Denmark, we have public health care. And these people that are really well intended, they have like 10, 15 minutes to see you, right? And then they have to see yeah. the next ones because it's like the public system and they need to treat so many patients. So they just don't have the time for it. 
and you can't always change doctors and you have to go out to the private system. I think it's different in the US and Canada where you have more free choice to choose um, and otherwise you need to have a bit extra money to be able to pay for it yourself. But it's, yeah. if you can find the money, it's definitely worth it to get that second opinion. There's also services popping up in Denmark where you can get a second opinion. Some other doctors or experts are looking at your results if, if you got some kind of diagnosis. Yeah, and then you would hope even in um, in Denmark and in Germany and wherever you are, that once you are more aware of what's going on in your body, you can ask better questions mm. too. So you can ask that even if you only have that one doctor to choose from, you can say, oh, can we run these certain labs? Like I was researching and I saw that this was really important to help build my immune system. Can I get these things done? And so kind of like opening up that dialogue or having that research there and saying like, oh, I saw that my drug would be more effective if my microbiome health was healthier. Can we run these tests? Like are these things that we can kind of like integrate into my protocol? So that would be nice if we have that integrative, but I see exactly that all the time where, you know, the doctor has 10 minutes, they don't really have the time and the questions and you kind of like, most patients are so nervous when they even go in, there's so much anxiety and fear. And they kind of look up to these people like, Oh, like they kind of like black out, especially during COVID when they're not even allowed to bring a loved one in with them. Mm. So they have to go into these appointments alone and they leave being like, what just happened? Like it's mm. a very overwhelming time and scary time. And so the more you can kind of prepare before these appointments, write down like the top questions you want to ask or things that can just help excel your results. Um, it's so important. Yeah. I really think that notebook is just like those five questions you want to make sure that you get before you get uh, kicked out of the door that uh, that you have them yeah. so you can just be like sorry uh, sir i have one more question that i kind of want to like get clarified right um, and like you want to be that annoying patient like be that annoying patient yeah. that i mean i love those patients i'm like yes you really care and you you've done your research and you want to know and you're invested in your own health because really like if you're not going to do that no one else is going to do that for you like having a loved one with you or having just being prepared like you are your own best doctor yeah what do you think is the most important step someone who just got diagnosed with cancer or is living with cancer can do? When when your first diagnosis kind of goes back to what we were just saying, um, you want to just not rush into any decisions. Really take the time, like just breathe. This is no longer a death sentence. It's not, I think that's what people first think is, oh, there's cancer. Okay, now I'm going to die but we know that's not true. There's a lot of stories and a lot of clinical research showing that we have so much more power. So kind of stepping back, taking a breather. I wouldn't even call all your family or friends right away. Like I wouldn't even just kind of like sit with yourself and digest that and think of what possibly could have led you up to this point. So just really internalizing and writing down journaling and then and then the next step is finding a doctor that can take more tests on you. Because I've seen this all the time where I've even just saw just a 37 year old who has brain cancer. And he's like, I have four children. I don't ever eat garbage food. I don't have a lot of stress. It's like all the things he's like, it makes no sense. And so what we're now doing is looking at his genetic profiling, like what is going on with his detox pathways. We're sending away his poop. We want to know what his immune system is. Is there any latent viruses or bacteria that's led to this? We want to know blood sugar levels. How is he regulating sugars? Well, look at his thyroid. Like we take all of these other measurements that are not just that cancer diagnosis. So for him, he left his oncologist thinking like, okay, I'm told I I'm going to die. And I'm told that you know, I have a year most and I just have to take this drug and I'm going to have all these awful side effects. He was so deflated. And so after meeting him, I'm like, we have a lot of research to do. It's not, that's kind of like, yep, you have the diagnosis. That's great. But I really encourage every patient to find someone who can run these extra tests and understand their body more. What created the cancer in the first place? Not just why is it there? Let's cut it out, burn it out and put all these poisons in our body. No, let's find out what is feeding this cancer, fueling the cancer in the first place. Got it. So what are some routines or therapies you tell patients to do? So, um, so one of them is we want to make sure that our gut is healthy. So if you think of our immune system, like 80% of our immune system is located in our gut. Um, there's even a lot of research out there showing that even drugs work more effectively when our microbiome is healthier. 
Um, so really gut health is, has to be number one. Um, I remember when I was younger, my mom would always ask me like what my poop looks like. And my first colonic was when I was 12 years old. I had a sore throat. I had a sore throat. My mom's like, you need to have a colonic because, you know, we need to clean out any kind of bacteria that's gone systematic. Like it's gone into your system. I'm like, are you crazy? <laughs> it sounds absolutely crazy to be treating an ear or throat infection by having a colonic. I don't uh, know if you know if you're Colonic? Through. A few more words on what that is. Yeah, so colonics are basically, it's colon hydrotherapy. Um, a lot of people think it's like a colos uh, colonoscopy, which it's not. Um, colonoscopy is like when the tube goes all the way into the colon and it's searching out for any polyps or any kind of ulcers. A colonic is different because the tube only goes like an inch into your rectum. The water is, you're with a therapist the entire time. Yeah. The water is really gentle going into to, to your system and it's carrying away any kind of like excess candida. We've seen parasites coming out. We can see food that the person literally ate like weeks ago coming out of their colon. So these are people who think like, oh, I go to the bathroom every single day and they think that they have a healthy gut. But meanwhile, there's things like fermenting, creating off gases making them feel more bloated. So colonics are just a way to like clean out any kind hmm. of debris or toxicity in the gut. So I was introduced to these at a very young age, kind of a little bit traumatized thinking like my mom is cuckoo. <laughs> but now my whole clinic is built off of, we have a couple colon hydrotherapists that their main focus is cleaning the gut. And we use it as an assessment tool too. So if they have a lot of yeast coming out, um, we see parasites all the time. We see stuff coming out of their gut. Like you can't build health if your gut is a mess. There's just no way. You can't just like take a probiotic and think, okay, I'm going to build the good bacteria in my gut if your 90% of your gut is with bad bacteria brewing in it. So colonics are a way just to kind of like clean out all of the bad and then replace, start helping the microbiome and cleaning it with healthier food. So things like sauerkraut, uh, culture, anything fermented, um, ke uh, kimchi and kefir, um, and a lot of the like prebiotic foods. So even like uh, sweet potato and squash, a lot of the root vegetables um, and then probiotics, prebiotics, all of those that we know just kind of like set the foundation for the healthy gut. So looking at gut health, um, if you have a practitioner that can send your poop away, like I do, it's really exciting because then you get the whole profile and we, we can check the DNA of the stool fibers and we can see like were they contracted with Epstein-Barr virus 15 years ago, and now it's affecting their immune system. So we can get the whole profile of even like what the good and bad bacteria. So if you're just taking probiotics, you want to know what strain you're actually needing. Like if you're low in certain bacteria, those are the ones that you want to replace. So finding someone who can test your poop for you is a really helpful tool because how else would you really know, right? So I had a few episodes in the microbiome and talked about the Bristol scale as well, which is something so simple to just have that. Hopefully you have a, a daily poop to look at your poop, see like, where am I in my, how is my body actually doing? Exactly. Um, so, yeah. So if you see like um, undigested food, if you see slime or mucus, if you see it, any other color except a medium brown, um, if it floats, that's also a problem. You want to see your poop sink. Um, if it Why is it not allowed to float? <laughs> what, <is that? laughs> what does that mean? You're like asking for a friend. Um, <laughs> so if, it, if it's floating, that means that there's undigested fat in the stool. And so it, it'll flow. And so you may have an issue with fat metabolism and how every cell in the body is made up of healthy fats, kind of like that lipid bilayer there. And so it's really important that you digest fats properly. So if you see it floating, you may want to try some like digestive enzymes or um, apple cider vinegar, things to just get like bile moving in the system. So that's a really big red flag too. I get, I get people to do a poop diary. So for a full week, Tell me what your poop looks like. Because people, hmm. a lot of them don't even look. They just yes. like, kind of run away from it. And they're like, oh, I'm so embarrassed to talk about my poop. <laughs> so. I think that's the first reaction for most people in the start. The first time I heard about having to look at my poop, I was also like, you say, what? <laughs> so, <laughs> I got to what? I was like, hell no, I'm not going to look at my poop. Now right. being in these health circles for a while and also did a microbiome test myself and have a much more relaxed relationship to it. But uh, I think the first time you hear it, you're like, you must be out of your mind. No way this is happening. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It does sound absolutely crazy. But then you think like, why would you not look at your poop? <laughs> There's so much information that you can get at. I have patients like send me text messages of what their poop looks like. I'm like, yeah. oh, 
okay. And I can just tell all about what's going on in their body from it. So yeah, you don't want to look in my phone probably. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't want to see those pictures. There's an app as well. One of my friends uses that actually attracts you poop. It doesn't take the pictures, but then you rate like what kind of poop, what time and so on. So he had a lot of digestive issues and stomach issues as well. Right. So that was a really easy way for him to kind of keep track of it instead of taking a picture and then when he had to show his pictures from summer vacations they would suddenly be like <laughs> poop showing up of like different sizes so this app worked a lot better exactly <laughs> yeah no that's a good idea to try any way that you want to track as long as you're looking and taking like a mental note um that's huge like half of your health problems could go away just by looking at that and making changes yeah so some of the critique about microbiome is the least that i heard is that um, it changes so fast. So like in 48 hours, um, your poop will change a lot. And even in the poop yourself. So for the listeners, if you really want to get graphic, you can close your eyes and imagine the last time you poop, you'll see this difference in part of the poop. So you'll get different results. You actually need to screw different places of the poop. Um, and, and some labs are not that accurate. What's, what's your take on that? Yeah, and so I um, I always get everyone to avoid any kind of probiotics, digestive enzymes, all the supplements they're taking for a good week before they do their stool collection. Um, where I send the uh, poop off to, they do it through DNA, which yep. is a much more reliable way because you're right. Like if you don't pass a parasite in that poop, then you're going to say, nope, there's no parasites. Mm. But when we can see virulence factors and immune factors, like it's a lot more about what's going on in their digestive system versus just like what happened to come out in that one poop. But having stool, um, the DNA checked is a really important part of it. Um, Just to know like what is actually more of a long-term issue versus you're right. Like you had that one off and you ate something that was spicy and it just gave you this crazy reaction but we there's so much more that you can tell when it's a comprehensive stool check like yeah. that okay got it do you know if that's the r16 sequencing that most stool tests are or the biome that uh, claims even though i heard a lot of negative stuff about the biome um, yeah. most people say it's, it's bullshit but at least it looks really good on their website and they're claiming they have this special NASA technology that they are passing that they can use or is it something completely else yeah, it's the uh, PCR testing from GI. It's GI Map, okay. uh, GI Map from uh, Designs for Health. Yeah, that's who I I run them through. But I guess yeah, it would be similar to the Viome testing. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. I have to look. I find it super fascinating because it it seems to be one of the big answers to a lot of the stuff in your health. Again, it's integrative. There's the holistic way, like there's the mental part. There's the water you drink what you eat and everything else. But right now it seems to be one of the big areas that we are finding more answers. Yeah. And what I like to do too, because there's a lot of like foundational things that you just know without even sending your poop away that you can tell about your system. So Mm. I I spent like a good month of just cleaning up, doing all the things, like doing all the colonics, cleaning up your system, even like coffee enemas are really important, just getting liver health and glutathione up, really cleaning up. And then if the person is still having the same issues or their blood work isn't changing and there's something else where it's like, okay, this is a lot more chronic than we Mm. thought. That's when I send the stool away. So it's not always my first line approach because we know that there's so much you can do without having to do that. And like you said, like it can change from one month to another. It's like, if you make a drastic health change in your life, then you want to do it at a time where it's like, okay, I've ruled, I've done everything now. Let's see what else is in the gut. Yeah. That sounds very I was going to say, if you have tons of money and you want to just every month run, do that. That's cool yeah. too. It's fine. So that approach sounds very similar to, similar to many of the other practitioners I had on. Uh, Ulrich, who is also a doctor who's specialized in the microbiome, or one of his focus areas at least, he always starts by, let's first change your diet and that stuff. Because I know you're going to get a, like, a bad result from the different tests we're doing right now. And then after a month or how long it takes, we've like gotten it closer. Now let's figure out what else is left and let's change it. But I would yeah. personally love to have a service if it wasn't super expensive to get that like weekly poop test sent in to kind of know same with like a blood test and so on. So, you know, like what are the small things that you can like optimize and screw on, right? And what's having the impact? Right. I know. It's, I wonder if there's some sort of like lab discount where it's like, hey, I'm going to invest once a month, get this done. Like, do I get a VIP package or something? Because that would be so yeah. interesting. Like switching up your microbiome, going from vegan to paleo. And let's see like what, how the dynamics of my gut are changing over time. Cause we do have so much power in that. So yeah, yeah. that'd be an interesting little mini trial to do. 
That would be fantastic. What are other things that you would tell patients as someone that just got diagnosed with cancer that they can do or they should uh, think about? So like we said before, just um, stopping and breathing. (laughs) Don't Google everything. Don't try to, because know that you are unique and your cancer is unique. How it starts to grow is unique. The full picture is so important. So kind of like step back, take some breathers. Do some research maybe after a few days, but looking to see who are the professionals in this field, who are the people that can look at me as a whole person instead of just looking at that tumor. So to try not to feel overwhelmed by it. And like we said before, not seeing it as just like a death sentence um, that you can do so much to change and looking at gut health, like we said gut health and microbiome, um, we can change the whole dynamic of how that cancer is growing if we have an environment where it's just not producing abnormal cells. And so that's a big deal. I'd say those are the top two, really just kind of like stepping back, getting your mindset right. Um, I find there's a huge correlation between the ones who mentally just know that they are going to survive. They just like that patient I said before, who was given a month left, he's like, no, not going to die not Mm. happening. He's like, I'm going to be here for my grandchildren and I'm going to be golfing in the spring. I know that I'm going to be here. So that mindset alone, because some people think like, oh, I was given six months or I was given and they believe it. Like Mm. you don't get taught that in med school. I don't believe maybe they do. They're told to like tell patients they can predict like the future like that. But you don't ever listen to that type of prognosis because those are the ones who they believe it and they maybe just do that drug trial. They don't do anything else. And that's where the stats are coming from. So knowing that you can believe you can beat those odds and that you have so much power to change things around. um, I think that mindset piece is huge. Realizing um, like having that faith. I'd say a lot of the patients that come here too just know that there's some higher power that they're meant to be on this earth longer. So don't give up and just listen to that prognosis. Got it. Is there any food, supplements, exercise form, breathing uh, way or something else that you see generically seems to be quite good? Either something we have studies on that you've seen from treating so many patients. Yeah, so it's interesting because I used to always think that like the heavy marathon runner and the triath- triathlon, like, all of those are just like the healthiest people in the world, right? The ones that have that endurance, but actually you're causing a lot of oxidative stress on the body and a lot of free radicals and just a lot of inflammation if you're this like go, go, go mentality. And so I was actually even just reading a research study from um, patients who three times a week just sat and were writing just writing for 10 minutes, three times a week, what that does to their natural killer cell production, their lymphocyte production, what that does to their immune system to really help fight these abnormal cancer cells or any kind of abnormal cells in the body. So a lot of the like relaxation, Mm -hmm. um, when you're sitting and breathing, um, you really need both. Like you can't just be go, go, go all the time. And I would say too, if you're that type of person who's a workaholic, you don't stop, you're up in late hours in the night, up early, you're just go, go, go you are the one that needs it the most to sit back and just do nothing, yeah. right? Like you need to sit and do nothing. Like don't read a book. Don't watch a movie. Like you're sitting. Nothing is like literally on the good breathing. That's it. Yeah. That intuitively makes a lot of sense. So many of our, like our system is just overloaded constantly with work, constantly having to perform on being like a super mom uh, and running a marathon or like being this top consultants that like do an iron man while still having a family and like this is like and then on social media as well constantly notifications like the system never gets the chances to be like Whew. yes even as you're speaking i feel my heart racing i'm like yes i know <laughs> that. and that's it's a lot of pressure and you think like when you get home that you have to now clean the house and do all these or you feel the guilt if you sit and do nothing a lot yeah. of people feel guilty about it but it's like no you are gonna break down your body cannot we're not meant to do that and even in the winter months like when it's darker and you and Dominican I'm sure you can't even relate right now but (laughs) when it's darker in those months we're meant to wind back a little bit Mm -hmm. and just relax and sleep a little bit more like don't feel guilty about it like your body will thank you and then you can be more productive later on I think that is so important and something that's missing very much in our society, given yeah. the mental space for doing nothing. Like exactly. people are like, okay, I can meditate because then I'm doing something productive. I'll go 20 minutes of meditating. Like that's, it's good to meditate, but sometimes it can also be good just to like, just sit and be, which is hard for many of us, right? Yeah. Just to be with ourselves. 
Yeah. And so for the people who say like, oh, there's no way I can sit there for three minutes and do nothing. I would say you are the ones that need it the most (laughs) for one. You're the ones that you absolutely need to do this. And so for me personally, I was that person where it's like, no way I'm not going to sit and meditate. Like, I don't even know what that means. Like that sounds like I'm being punished. (laughs) So what I do now is before I get into work, I'll just turn off my phone, turn off the music. I'll sit in my car. I'll just set my timer for 10 minutes. I sit and breathe. Or I find like five minutes randomly throughout the day. I'm like, I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. If I just kind of intertwine it like that, or once I get home before going into the house, I do another five minutes just to really have that me time, which we've lost. Like you said, with social media and all of that, it's really easy to get torn in a million directions. So it is. And it's weird what like sometimes get us back to understand like this is what we need. I went to some uh, a body worker yesterday who worked on me like for three and a half hours, different like resistance stretching and so on. And kind of got that openness of being more in my body afterwards and openness in my chest. Um, and I came back and I was just like in a much more calm state. I'm normally like that hyperactive, happy, jumping around, like go, 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 go. Uh, but I was just like another level. And I just like <laughs> sat in the chair for like... <laughs> 20 minutes, no phone, nothing else. And it's just like, it was a good feeling. Something that the body needs as well. That mix of just being like full on kite surfing, Muay Thai, jumping out of a plane, trying like things with adrenaline. But the body also needs to like, just breathe and relax. Yeah. Like you just found Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, all oh, the lights just open up and you're right. It's like you see life at a different um, angle. Because yeah, the adrenaline, all of that is amazing and fun. But yeah, to kind of have that relaxed perspective, you can just look, make better decisions. Mm. You can just feel more grounded in general. So, yeah. okay. so time is running really fast, Laurie. I feel like I can talk to you for hours. So uh, just before we round off, where can people learn more about you? So you can go to drlaurie.ca. So drlor.ca. And I actually have this really cool um, cancer toolkit that you can get for free. So it's all the questions you want to ask your doctors, um, just the top therapies, the things that you really want to do to um, after a cancer diagnosis, or if you know anyone that has been diagnosed with cancer, a loved one. Um, So drlaurie.ca is where you can get that information. Great. I'll put that in the show notes as well. Social media, your book as well. Yeah, so at Dr. Lori Bouchard, I'm on Instagram quite often, so you can interact with me there. And if you have any questions, you can uh, DM me, private message me. Um, yeah, I'm always on Instagram, so you can follow all my exciting stories about health. Yeah, great. Do you take international clients as well, or only Canadian clients? Um, yeah, we do. I do international as well. Yeah, so uh, virtual, virtual calls. All right, so it is possible if someone wants like that. Sounds pretty cool. I need to work with her. Uh, but I'm in Denmark it's still possible absolutely yep yeah that's amazing fantastic so summing up if we should say like the three top advice for someone with cancer and this goes into our social media production as well so we have that like catchy title okay um number one look at your poop we want to know (laughs) what is in your gut and what is predicting your immune system so gut health and your microbiome um either send that away or do have one of those apps that you're able to track it what's going on um number two get your mindset right so not doing just something that someone else is telling you to do you really want to do your own research ask all the questions um number three i would say um, take some me time, just really be alone with yourself and be intuitive and feel like, um, just kind of build that strength again without feeling like go, 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 go all the time or feeling like cancer is this death sentence because it's not. So kind of sitting back and getting one with one with the, I want to say Jesus, but it's really one with, one with that your spiritual self and just feeling like, what is the next step that I need to do? Love it. That is absolutely perfect. Is there any one habit that uh, you do every single day or that you really want to implement in your life? Uh, So the one habit that I do every day is I have to listen to some sort of like reggae or hip hop music. I just have to have something that just kind of changes the vibe because, you know, when you talk about research and studies and you talk about cancer all the time I feel like you need something just to kind of offset that and dance and just kind of like be in a different uh vibration so for me it's putting on music and that's where I just feel 
um, my best. And I have three children too. So it's really three young kids having a little dance party every single day. That's like a, a non-negotiable. <laughs> that is beautiful. I think that's definitely a recommendation for listeners well. So we actually uh, started down here in uh, Dominican and we're trying to get that uh, in the morning. We do uh, a small dance, one one song, just getting that flow and that happiness of just being being and, and having fun instead of always being like on of having to do something. Yes, I love that, right? And you just know your whole day is going to be different if you take that time just to have fun and laugh and dance. And it's that's great. So Laurie, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing. Thank you so much for having me. This is fun. Thanks.